Math 1332, Chapter 2, Set Theory, Section 5, Infinite Sets, Video 1, A Better Definition of Infinite Sets. I'm trying something new in this video. As you can tell, I've got some things blacked out, so I don't have to spend as much time typing them during the video, and I'll simply remove the black boxes on top of things as we get to them. All right, so, <coughs> excuse me, a few sections ago, in this chapter, we had discussed the concept of infinite sets, and I just want to remind you what those definitions were. Our definition of a finite set was a set whose cardinality is zero or a natural number, which is equivalent to saying that their cardinality is a whole number. Remember that the natural numbers start with one, one, two, three, four, etc., and the whole numbers start with zero, zero, one, two, three, four. We have to include zero because the empty set whose cardinality is zero should clearly be classified as a finite set. Um, so what was the definition of an empty set? Excuse me, of an infinite set. The definition of an infinite set was a set that is not finite. So it's kind of a cop-out definition. We really don't have a definition for you. So we'll just say that you're not that other guy. You're not a finite set. Um, and there was something that we also saw previously that kind of made us scratch our heads a little bit. And I think I kind of let the cat out of the bag back then, but let's see. Previously, we had made the observation that the natural numbers, the numbers that start with one, can be placed in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the whole numbers, the numbers that start with e, with zero, even though the natural numbers are a proper subset of the whole numbers. Specifically, the natural numbers that start with one, two, three, four, and the whole numbers uh, that start with zero, one, two, three, um, can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. And remember, all it means to have a one-to-one -one correspondence is to be able to match up each number with one set or each element with one set with another element, with an element of the other set so that every element is paired with one and exactly one partner. In this case, we could pair one with zero, two with one, three with two, four with three. And if we wanted to be super generic, we could even say that whatever number we see up top, let's just call it N. Uh, let's not call it N because we reserve that for cardinality. Let's call it K. Then the number that it would pair up with is one less than that, K minus one. You can see that over here. Here's four, one less than four is three. Here's three, one less than three is two, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, which kind of implies that these sets have the same size. Everybody has a partner, nobody's left out. Everybody has exactly one partner, like when you match up your fingers, and nobody's left out. But um, clearly, this being the natural numbers, and this being the whole numbers, we have that the natural numbers are a proper subset which means every natural number is part of the whole numbers, but the two sets aren't equal. The two sets aren't equal or equivalent, I should, well, they're not equal. They're not, um, they are equivalent though, which is a little bit interesting because equivalent means that they have the same cardinality in the sense that we have this one-to-one -one correspondence, but they're clearly not equal because the whole numbers contain zero, whereas the natural numbers do not. So it's kind of weird that we're saying two things that seem contradictory. Number one, the sets are the same size because we can pair up all of their elements and nobody has more than one partner and nobody's left out. But we're also saying that the sets are not the same size because they're not equal. The natural numbers are a proper subset of the whole numbers. So what's going on here? Well, before I uh, let the cat out of the bag, I need to remind you that not all sets can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. For example, let's consider the finite set one, two, three, four, five, whose cardinality happens to be five, and a proper subset of it, one, two, three, and four, if, whose cardinality happens to be four. If we try to set up a one-to-one -one correspondence, the natural way would be to match each number with itself. But we want run into a problem when we get to the five. Either we leave it unpaired, which can't happen in a one-to-one -one correspondence, or we pair it with somebody, which forces a two-to-one correspondence here. Two of these elements correspond to one. So no matter what we do, 
we can't put these in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Either somebody's left out or somebody has more than one number paired with them. So not all sets can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. Be honest, I don't remember what's underneath here. Oh, so why can we do this for some sets but not others? Well, it might seem kind of obvious, especially given the title of this section. But the reason we could do it here, put the whole numbers in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself, is because the whole numbers were infinitely large. There, it's an infinite set based on our previous definitions. But the reason we couldn't do it here is that the first set, one, two, three, four, five, or the set containing one, two, three, four, five, was not infinite. If you're a proper subset, we pretty much have to remove an element from you, at least one element. And if you're a finite set, that lowers your cardinality, which means that we can't pair everybody up. But if you're an infinite set, you're so large that when we remove one of your elements, in this case, we remove the number zero from the whole numbers to get the natural numbers. Uh, if you're an infinite set, you're so large that when we remove one of your elements, you're still infinitely large. We didn't change how large you are. But we need a more formal definition. I mean, we got an idea here. And the formal definition has actually already been played out. So let's get to it. An infinite set is a set that can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. Meaning that if we mo remove a small number of elements to get a smaller subset, we can still match everybody up because both sets are infinitely large. By contrast, a finite set is a set that cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the proper subset of itself. Can't let that get by. So we're, we can redefine what it means to be finite or infinite by asking, can I put you in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of yourself? If I can, congratulations, you're infinitely large. If I can't, then uh, you're not infinitely large, so you're finite. Let's take a look at one quick example and then we'll wrap up this video. We're gonna show that the set containing five, 10, 15, 20, and so on is an infinite set. It should be pretty transparent what the pattern is here. These are skipping by fives. Now, if we're gonna show it's an infinite set, and I should clarify, show it's an infinite set using the new definition. If we use the old de definition, we would simply say, well, it's, its cardinality is not a natural number because we would never stop counting, therefore it's infinite. But uh, I, I wanna use the definition that says we can put it in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. Now, how are we gonna do this? Well, first we gotta find a proper subset of it. Let's start with the original set. And we're gonna try something a little, a little algebraic, but it's not too bad. <clears throat> If we represented a generic element in this set as K, what could we do to every element in this set that would turn it into a different element of the set? In other words, what could we do with the five that would turn it into something else down the line? There's actually a lot of answers to that, but I think the easiest thing that we can do is add five. We're going to make a new set by adding five to every element of this set. But not only do we want to make a new set, we want to make a set that is a proper subset of our original set. If I add five to five, that will give me 10. If I add five to 10, that will give me 15. If I add to five to 15, that will give me 20. If I add five to 20, that will give me 25. And down the road, what will I get if I add five to K? I don't start going K, L, M, N, O, P. That's not how algebra works. Uh, remember in algebra, a, a variable is just uh, a placeholder for a number that we don't know. So we can't just treat it like another number 
for example, if we add five to K, we just can't count five number five letters down in the alphabet. What we can do is write our intentions. If we take the K and add five to it, we would get K plus five, which we don't know what it equals because we don't know what K equals there. But that's what we're doing to all the elements in the original set to create elements in the new set. Now, is the second set a proper subset of the first one? The answer is yes. Because if you notice, this whole set is right here. It goes on forever. So it's a subset because every, every element down here belongs up there somewhere. 25 would be the next number here. One second, folks, not sure what's going on here. Having some things jump around my screen, I don't think you can see it. All right, so anyway, the bottom set is a proper subset of the original set. Uh, it's a subset because it's contained inside of it, but it's also a proper subset because there's one element on the top that's not represented. That five is not represented below. And it may be obvious just looking that the bottom set is a proper subset of the top one. And because of that, that means that the original set is infinite. Since five, 10, oops, that was supposed to be a brace. Five, 10, 15, 20, can be, let me widen this text box. Here we go. Put in a one to one correspondence with a proper subset of itself, comma, then the set is infinite. So that's, all, that's, that's really all you have to do in terms of this definition to show a set is infinite is to put it in a proper uh, put in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself. And I'll tell you the easiest way to do it. Here we did the plus five move and that was cute. But honestly, I didn't need to do a plus five move. I just did the plus five move so that I could say what happens to a generic element over here. I did not mean for that to happen, but that's okay. Really all you have to do is lop off the first element move everybody over one space, and then you have your one-to-one -one correspondence. Basically, you're corresponding one element in the set with the next element in the set, assuming there's some sort of order. All right, so that's our new definition of a, an infinite set, a set that can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of itself.